She's the shy one. <laughs> Victor, I was laughing, you know, at that comment you made about being on the phone with three Irish communists and you couldn't get a word in edgewise. I assure you that had nothing to do with them being communists. <laughs> uh, so I would say if you're Roshan, you can have a seat, because I know Roshan really is, she just asked me to say a few words. And, so I'd like to say good morning to everybody, I think, if it's still morning or early afternoon here, but it really is a true honor and a pleasure to be with you here today. Our family, thank you so much for the invitation to both Carmens, who've been very gracious, really been terrific to kind of work with and deal with. So on behalf of our relations, uh, the Walshes, the O'Briens, Hooligans, and Harringtons um, from Australia, South Africa, Scotland, Ireland, and the US, we thank you for keeping Uncle Brian's memory alive and in your hearts. We are extremely appreciative and very proud of all his achievements, but appreciative of all the honors that you have bestowed on him over the years. It has really been incredible. So we all know how much Monsignor Brian loved to fly his plane, even from a very early age. And in many ways, flying uh, has been a good metaphor, is a good metaphor for the higher purpose by which he lived his life. He always operated at an altitude that was far greater than is reasonable to expect from a good and very caring person. Many of us can only hope to leave this world a little bit better than the way we found it, but how rare it is and has been to experience a life that has had such a profound impact on so many. And it is so real uh, and warm to be in this room here today and hear your history, which we've heard obviously over the years, but never sometimes at the depth. Um, Roshi and again and I are just delighted to be representing the family here. So Monsignor Brian was very much a man of giving, and I've heard that a lot today, and also very much a man of family. And I, I really kind of put those two pieces together, whether it was his religious family, his Pedro Pan family, his Miami community family, or his blood relations, he always found ways to connect, ways to give, and have a lasting impact on so many of us. And as was his way with many of my relatives, he flew, he married my wife and I, he christened both our children, he did the same with so many of our cousins. Um, he traveled to New York for his final surgery and once again reached out. He stayed with us. We had a lovely evening with him um, and he came to stay and the kids still talked about it. It's very interesting. My son was very young at the time. He's 14 now. And he uh, remembered him profoundly. It was, it was this almost like amazing thing that happened. Uh, so our son's 14. You know, he's about four at the time. And for, for the longest time thereafter, he would talk about Monsignor Brian, and almost really like they ha he had the sort of religious experience. It was, very, um, it, was, it was very uncanny to kind of be around. Well, he traveled to us for that surgery, and obviously we never thought it was going to be the last time that we saw him. But as I was saying to Roshan on the flight yesterday, there's something in hindsight looking back on that that I wonder if he actually knew that this was going to be a challenging surgery. He actually even called me and checked in a few hours even before surgery. I think Roshan got to talk to him a little bit post-surgery. Um, so again, uh, a man who always took the time and, and, and was very willing to be there. As busy as he was, hearing these stories, I don't know how he had time. Even, you know, I'm not talking about it was the 60s or something, but I know he was a very, very busy man. And we didn't probably fully appreciate it as nephews and nieces, that he took the time to be in all these different countries um, to do things as quietly and as humbly as he always did. So growing up, we'd heard a lot of good things about the things that he had done. And it was really, though, at his funeral here in Miami when I really experienced the outpouring of love from the Miami and Pedro Pan community that I realized much more fully the kind of impact that he had on so many. He was our Uncle Brian. He was one of the family. He was not the, the saint, so to speak, that we hope he will become. Um, but this is really because, and Victor said it, he was really a very humble person. And I look back on it. Um, I don't recall him ever talking about the good things that he did, ever, in all the years that we used to spend time with him. Now, don't get me wrong, he was also a very confident person who had very strong opinions. And as children, we would be on our best behavior around him, you know, given his, as you know, his booming, deep, and very much mixed Irish and American accent, which I've sort of picked up over the years myself. So my mother used to tell us, um, about the many masses that she would attend with, uh, with her brother, and they attended growing up, and how he would sing uh, the hymns at the top of his lungs. <laughs> For those of you who remember him. Now, he had many talents. Singing was not one of them. <laughs> but the beautiful thing about this story is that he knew he didn't have a pleasant voice to the ear, but he really believed that hymns were prayers 
and that you should give your all when praising or talking to God. I'm going to share with you, bear a few minutes more with me, uh, several reflections from my uncle Tony, Brian's young, the, the baby of the family, Tony's wife, Phil, who were here actually a few, you know, not even two months ago. And uh, also their children, uh, Peter and Jenny. And Jenny is actually living in Australia. I'll start with Tony's, and these are written in the first person. So Brian was the eldest in the family, and I'm the youngest. All the mischief was contained in my sisters and me. He was a model son and never put a foot wrong. My mother had a lovely story about the occasion he took uh, when he took her to Paris. She was very excited as she had studied French as a girl, and this was her very first flight. Of course, she was quite nervous too, and after takeoff, take she searched for, in her handbag for her rosary beads. But instead of comforting words, all that she heard was, it's too late for that now. <laughs> we are 20,000 feet in the air. I recalled his words many years later when we traveled with him to Mexico City. Coming in to land, to, to, he happened to mention that this would be a very scary time due to the terrain around the land, uh, sorry, due to the terrain around the airport and the temperament of the crew. Of course, we landed safely, and he went on to enjoy many more flights all over the world. I have no doubt that it was his faith and trust in the Lord that saw him through many adventurous challenges he took, he took on. The second quick reflection here I have is from my Auntie Phil, who actually was terrific in, in pulling these together and, um, and, and talking through uh, what I would kind of mention today. So here's Phil's comments, again in the first person. Brian loved memorable objects like boats, planes, movable objects, excuse me, like boats, planes, automobiles, and even bicycles. He learned to pilot a plane as a teenager and made great use of that skill during his years in Florida. On one of the holidays with him, he persuaded me to board a light aircraft and take a tour of South Florida. Of his prowess as a pilot, there was no doubt, but taking his hands off the joystick to point out places of interest below was one of the most frightening and terrifying moments that she will never experience again, or has never. When he retired and we holidayed with him on the houseboat, I watched him cast off from jetties, maneuver through locks and berth in difficult situations, admiring his disciplines and strength. On one occasion, he even allowed me to take the helm and steer the, his lovely craft down the Shannon River. Sweet memories. And from my cousin Peter, big sports fan, Peter actually schooled here at St. Thomas um, for four years. It was 1985 and it was my second year at St. Thomas University where I studied sports administration. My housemates decided that we would celebrate St. Patrick's Day in a good old Irish way and we stocked up with the best of green beer, if there is such a thing. The following day, my uncle Brian had arranged to collect me and take me to St. Patrick's Day Mass at the cathedral. This was a very special occasion for me and he was such a busy man. Unfortunately, while on our way on Route I-95, the excesses of the previous night took their toll and we had to stop several times on the hard shoulder. You can guess the rest of the story, it was not one of my finest moments. Some of you here today who may have gotten into trouble with him when you were a teenager may guess his reaction. Being Brian, he didn't raise his voice. There were no harsh words, there were no recriminations. He knew how I was suffering and that was enough for him. I had learned my lesson. During my four years in Miami, he was always there for me, and even though he had little interest in sport, he made a great effort to be informed about my favorite sport teams and how they were doing. He was a great communicator, but he was also a great listener. And the last quick reflection is from my cousin Jenny in Australia. My uncle Brian was a tall man, and as a young shy girl, I remember I was terrified to talk to him. Despite this, I have wonderful memories of our family holidays in Miami and spending Christmas with him in Ireland. Like my brother Peter, some of my memories include feeling under the weather, but most of these were due to travel sickness um, through a trip of, in an airplane or in a boat. He warned me plenty of times about not sitting below deck, but of course I didn't listen. One of my greatest memories was having Brian come to Australia to officiate at my wedding to her husband Paul. And day, uh, the day before the wedding, Brian asked Paul if he would like him to hear his confession. And Paul replied that that would not be necessary, <laughs> as I don't sin. <laughs> like you, Brian laughed, and tapping him on the head, replied, I wish there were more of us like you. <laughs> to me, this epitomizes that no matter what your beliefs or values may be, 
Brian was always respectful of them, and he would always be glad to know, and he would be glad to know that over the years I have become a better traveler. So let me just wrap up here. I know lunch smells fantastic. Uncle Brian, Monsignor Brian, was a great role model for all of us and left us many examples of how we can all give more of ourselves and give more of our time to others. Thank you for listening. Roshin and I are very much looking forward to spending the weekend with you, hearing about your amazing journey and getting to know many, many of you. Thanks again.